All right, welcome back to the Dabrowski Congress. Next up, we have Dr. Karen Arnstein presenting on the spiral model of development, understanding the GT2E developmental trajectory. Thank you, Joy. Welcome. I'm very excited and a good bit nervous to present an idea I've been working on the last several years. The spiral model is a super synthesis of multiple theories with quantitative structures that uses the concepts of time, cartography, spatial modeling to provide a new conceptual framework and reframe our current understanding of giftedness and twice exceptionalities. <clears throat> in the summer of 2017, I was in the first quarter of my doctoral program here at DU, in this building. Dr. Hoffenstein gave me the Vike Kreshaw King Care 2016 article, Openness to Experience, rather than Overexcitabilities, so that I can consider a different perspective. I just finished all the articles by Tillier and Mendaglio, and I was thinking about how Dabrowski's levels seem like a vertical model, as if a person were to experience TPD, there's this connotation of failure as they slip down temporarily to a lower level. After mapping out the five factor model, I started to see a pink gemstone with its facets reflecting light back as it slowly rotated before me. I looked up, but I never saw the trees outside the library window. <clears throat> Instead, I saw in my mind's eye, a colorful moving three dimensional model. I went back to California and began to build a physical representation of the model I will present to you today. Sorry. There we go. That's the model I built. The 1960s were a really exciting period in psychology, expanding our understanding about human growth and development. Erickson and Dabrowski did not have the visualization tools that we have today. In fact, when they developed their theories, there was no conception of the big blue marble that came along in 1972. <clears throat> Today, we have um, things like cell phones, right, that we carry with us all the time to think about the world around us with, um, with added dimension. We can also use tools that allow us to see things with more accurate human and natural descriptions that resonate with authenticity. So our roadmap today, we'll cover a few theoretical frameworks and we'll also talk about why I'm gonna talk about Bronfenbrenner at a Dabrowski Congress. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I know, right? Um, we'll also talk about the world as we know it, or do we? Um, flip on over to Greenland for a little bit of basic cartography, and then start to discuss Jabrowski's Owens and the Spiral for part one and part two, before we head out to Pluto and back to Earth for some snacks. So like Frank said earlier on yesterday, strap in, but this is like roller coaster strapping in, okay? <laughs> Humans are multifaceted, and with the plethora of theories, there's no one single model that can accurately explain their development. Although Dabrowski's theory comes the closest to explaining developmental potential, we need a new perspective to critically synthesize concepts of time, cartography, and spatial modeling that transforms into a conceptual framework to reframe our current understanding. So what do these have in common? Well, between Erickson, Dabrowski, Bronfenbrenner, and Maslow, all of these address human development, but from a two-dimensional perspective. They, some of them considered changes over time, like Bronfenbrenner's chronosystem and Erickson's stages. The issue here is that time is referenced as a benchmark, so this delineates the end of one stage and the beginning of another. <clears throat> so let's step back for a larger view to see context beyond levels and time. <coughs> the spiral model is 
grounded in Bronfenbrenner's bio, uh, bioecological system theory on several levels. The macro system is where the spiral model is focused. Each of us sitting here has been shaped by the attitudes and ideologies of the culture in which we are raised. For example, teachers don't refer students for assessments or services <coughs> due to potential implicit bias. Another is, example is the system that actively prevents teachers from developing an awareness of their own implicit bias. In fact, our current macro system has a tendency to insult people for being woke or for um, recognizing their implicit bias and wanting to change structural inequities. And if you take a look, this was just a very quick Google search that I did. And I found a few examples of people who were working, actively working to try to change structural inequities that they found. So what we do know here is that the macro system leads to distortion. So speaking of the world, does anybody here know what's wrong with this map? <laughs> not the size of North America. Anybody else? Okay, North America and Europe are centered. Anyone else? Oh, I heard it. Dan? Greenland is huge. Greenland is huge. I know. <laughs> Thank you. We get a door prize over here, please. Give them some candy. Okay, so what we know here is that yes, this was actually, he's right. Greenland is huge, it's much larger than it actually is. This is a Mercator map. This is actually created by uh, Gerardus Mercator in the 16th century as a navigational tool, right? So you see all our parallels, lines of latitude, longitude are all straight. This is for sailors, just not to know what distance and measurement are. Um, it's very popular because it fills in the rectangular wall space with more map. The problem is, is that it remains really inaccurate. But it's what we know, right? It's what we see all the time. So we also know that Greenland's proximity to the pole makes it a problem when we continue to use widely accepted inaccurate maps as truth. The closer to the equator, the smaller Greenland appears due to the increased precision of measurement. The further from the equator, the greater the distortion. So I didn't change this. I just moved Greenland around. Anybody can play with this website to do the same thing. I, I don't have that much power. Just as distortion occurs in cartography, it also occurs as students move beyond the mean within education and psychology. The strikingly perfect symmetry of the normal curve is indicative that it is a theoretical ideal where real life distributions will never match this model. And I'm sorry, Linda, I told you there'd be no math today, but I lied, I'm really sorry. So what we start to see here is that the perfect distribution represents self-regulated responses, which typically only occur within the first standard deviation. We also expect self-regulated responses, but distortions appear at the second, third, and fourth, and beyond in those standard deviations. And that responses appear distorted to the intersectionality of OEs. Contextual change. We have a new teacher, it's the next year, right? Maybe their parents move, there's a new job, it could be a new brother or sister in the household. Anything could be happening in their context of their world. Or there's the internal needs of a 2E or PG individual. So all of those things can cause some of these changes. So what if we had a different perspective of the normal curve <clears throat> that was aligned more with nature? In cartography, we always start with the equator to get our bearings. Moving along the meridians to determine distance, time, and location to navigate our decisions. In education, we begin at the mean and assess which standard deviation a student falls within to determine academic placement and specialized services. Both fields, though, are plagued with distortion and a need for correction. 
Suddenly, our perceptions are challenged as we find the largest group in the first standard deviation of the mean, the 68.26%, appears to be the most accurately represented group. The gifted and intellectually disabled populations would appear to be the largest groups, but statistically are the smallest. So all metaphors aside, our education system is designed and enacted to meet the needs of the average two thirds, yet struggles to do so for the outliers. So how do the outliers fit in here? Speaking of outliers, like I said, the spiral model is grounded in Dabrowski's work, starting with the most notable attribute of the gifted in two E, OEs. If gifted kids and their OEs were binary, like a light switch, they would be very easy to understand, but they're not. There's a whole range that accompanies OEs that doesn't account even for positive disintegration. So as you can see up here, for number one, it's the light switch. People aren't binary, right? We have to use a dimmer switch to be able to understand. OEs don't just flip on and off, on and off like this. Otherwise it would look like these up and down like a bouncing ball. Rather, we do have to look at this as more like a dimmer switch, which is number two. So when the OEs are low, okay, on the down side, the student to a teacher or to a counselor will appear competent. Um, they'll appear that they can learn. It's not that they weren't learning, but they appear that they can learn what the teacher wants them to learn at that time. That's important to remember. When you take a look and the OEs are high and they're activated, right? The student does not appear competent. They may have difficulty focusing or learning as per the teacher or counselor's point of view, right? It's not that they're not learning, it's that they're not learning what the teacher wants them to learn at that moment. So you have to look at this more like a side wave, not just up and down. Um, a perfect example. Mrs. Rogers' third grade math class. I spent at least half the year staring at a long division problem on a sheet of paper that had so many erasure marks you couldn't even see it anymore, what the problem was. Every day I lined up at her desk to ask for help. And every day she sent me back to my desk. This went on for months and months. So what did I do? I sat and I watched the board while she taught the other kids all the rest of the math for the rest of the school year. So to her, I did not appear competent because I wasn't learning in this piece of curriculum at that moment in time. What happened was I was still learning because fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, my math took off. Bronfenbrenner's PPCT, or Process Person Context Time, can help us from the outside or the macro system to identify the factors or vectors that can stimulate OEs and watch for TPD. Vectors are anything that are either inherent in the child, the person, such as IQ, race, health, or gender. They also include the macro system, such as ideologies, culture, language, school. These vectors are important to account for in the macro system because they impact the development and the developmental potential of the child. Bronfenbrenner's PPCT helps us understand how the twice exceptional are engaged in processes that they do not fit. Instead, they stimulate the student to the point where the amygdala is engaged in flight, fright, or freeze. These interactions can have a multiplicative interactive effect. When these vectors combine and interact with each other over time, you get a spiral. I'm adding the next dimension and color to Dabrowski's work by taking the entire macro system that the individual is developing within to understand their developmental potential as well as developmental trajectory. Now, let's take a trip.
Putting Bronfenbrenner's PPCT aside for a moment, we're going to come right back to it. As an analogy, let's consider a child like a planet revolving around a star with a circular orbit. Once upon a time, we considered, we considered planets to have this neat and tidy circular orbit around a star. Well, that was until Kepler came along and he discovered that they actually have elliptical orbits. The neurotypical make up about two thirds of the student population and they tend to have that circular orbit around the sun. For generations, <clears throat> teachers' expectations have been grounded on this Newtonian circular orbit. This causes them to struggle to meet the needs of a student who does not fit their ideal model. Now let's think of the most asynchronous, the twice exceptional. The twice exceptional student, as we think of the most eccentric orbit in our system, Pluto. Just like in planetary and orbital science, the solution was to move to a more accurate representation. Even with elliptical orbits, there are periods when the planets are closer to the sun or the moon. But the educational system wants them to fit into the expected model, the circular orbit. The more asynchronous students are, the more elliptical their orbits. This is why two-week students are Pluto. We live in a world where the macro system is looking for, <clears throat> we are looking, sorry, for the circular orbit to determine competence. It is critical to define the dependent variable as the appearance of competency may change drastically. For example, you may have an 11 year old attending college, but struggling to tie his shoes. Are you examining the cognitive or the fine motor skills? This is like using GAI versus full scale IQ when the student has a wide range between their highs and lows in each area. As the 2E child moves further from the mean on their specific elliptical developmental path, the appearance of competency may suddenly change causing concern for parents and educators. The higher the IQ, the more asynchronous they appear. The outliers are those who teachers in the macro system rarely see because their orbit around the norm is so widely elliptical. I resented Mrs. Rogers for many years for not believing in me. And looking back from her point of view, I see that I did not appear to be competent based on one aspect of the curriculum. Therefore, I was no longer worthy of her time. Yes, as an undiagnosed 2E student, I had an elliptical orbit too. Oops. Let's go back. If we only examine student performance based on scores, identifying placement within the standard deviations of IQ, even with fluid intelligence at play, we won't expect large fluctuations. The variables used to describe the appearance of competency, such as social, emotional, or academic skills, need to be clearly defined before data collection. This is where context matters, as definitions can vary widely based on the macro system within which the researcher and participant sample is working within. So as you can see from the image on the bottom left, the neurotypical student has a mostly forward developmental trajectory. The twice exceptional student is the one whose growth trajectory is characterized by that two steps forward, one step back, <laughs> kind of very circuitous. So the last thing is that imagine if the earth had OEs and pollution or war could activate those overexcitabilities, increasing the speed on the axis, shortening the day from 24 hours to 12. What would happen to our ecosystems and life? There's a lot of energy expended without anything to show for it. This sped up day does not impact the elliptical orbit around the sun, which is the year. 
but it can foretell a potential disintegrative event like the kinetic energy built up in a child's pullback car. In this state, students appear to stagnate and possibly regress for what may seem like months. This pressure increases the spin on their planetary axis, but it's a sign of a slow buildup of inner tension and may be a sign of level two or unilevel disintegration until one day they wake up and make a developmental or cognitive leap. So taking this next step further, a multi-level development through positive disintegration forms a complex inner psychic milieu. This is where the individual feels off balance as if their axis is wobbling within their orbit. So some implications to think about. Um, context within the macro system, TPD, identification, and the appearance of competency, they all need to work together. We can't change a planet's orbit. We need to change our perspective on what we see in front of us to decrease distortion and increase accuracy about this, these populations. The educational system and lack of fit in the macro system act as pressures, activating the overexcitabilities in gifted and twice exceptional persons. Taking Dabrowski and applying his work within broader multi systems perspectives, we can increase the awareness of OEs, but not just OEs, TPD in education and counseling. And finally, the spiral model of development can provide the paradigm shift necessary to understand the developmental trajectory of the twice exception. So I know I gave you a lot. <laughs> we probably need a few months to unpack all of this, but I wanted to make sure that we also had enough time for discussion. I really would love feedback from the people in this room and on the Zoom chat to help me move this work forward. I definitely welcome your feedback and I'm happy to go to any slide if you want to see it further. And then these are because Norma taught me well. <laughs> okay. Yes. I just have an observation. Um, the normal curve doesn't work. We have an abnormal normal curve to begin with that is not related to the factors that we put in, but there, there are humps on both ends. Yes, known humps. One that's really known at the lower end, but there's another lesser known one at the upper end at about 150. So the, the this is, as you said, theoretical, but there really are two, two little humps at, the, at each end. I agree. So the question or the, the comment here for those of you on Zoom was that this distribution curve, this Gaussian curve, yes, it's very perfect, but we actually know that there's more humps or you know upper areas at each end, especially on the right side as we get to about that IQ of 150. So we do know that, and I, I didn't put it in here. We also know too that in teacher prep programs, if they even see this, by the way, they're lucky, and it's probably because they had me as their instructor, okay? But they rarely see this. And so this is also would never happen in a typical classroom either. We know that it's always going to be skewed, right? It's, it's going to be kind of either skewed one way if it's a special ed classroom or skewed the other way if it's a gifted self-contained classroom. We know that. And then we still have the next hump and over like over the fourth standard deviation. Yes. And forgive Mrs. Rogers because she's bad phobic. <laughs> <laughs> so am I, I apparently <laughs> thank you you know more about math than Mrs. Rogers <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> um there's one over here too so Frank well when you look at the concept of the random example of the distribution of random 
Have I looked at the distribution of random sampling of means? Yeah. No, I have not, but I will. Uh, yeah. It gives you a little different perspective. Uh, what the goal is. Why it exists? Uh, because we thought about individual samples, really about taking a whole bunch of different samples, different places with all the spectrum, mm -hmm. and then doing the distribution of those means. Provide people with different perspectives on it. <coughs> This sounds good. Okay, thank you. I will yeah. definitely look into that. Yeah, it, it's interesting. It's a little more left than Curtis. We can get a little bit more. Uh, standard deviation sort of stuff. Um, at any rate, it gives you a perspective to begin to think about what happens <clears throat> when you start talking about having more extreme. Mm -hmm. how they are, how Trust me, I'm gonna. I'm planning on like reaching out to Linda to get some of this data. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Joy. Wow. So the student is like at or above the teacher or the counselor's level? Oh my gosh. That's a good question. Okay. How does it how does a counselor, right? How does a counselor or teacher? Okay. How does a counselor or teacher um how do their own developmental impact um their ability to work with or help a student whose developmental level is above theirs yeah wow that's a great question <laughs> oh my god um From the limited experience that I have and the limited reading that I've done, because I'm a fairly young scholar, I would say I think the first step is at least awareness, which it sounds like that person has. Um, but I'm not sure after that. I don't know. Anybody else here? Norma? <laughs> How would they help them? Yeah. I would say it's really important to remember, regardless of development, that everyone has something to teach you and they're being yeah. within an environment so we look for you know i'm sorry we look for the good i'm looking over here because you know anyway uh, everyone has something to teach them. so i think that's a great yeah thank you patty i'm going to go back to susan baum stuff too which is that everybody has strengths and everybody has something to contribute um shout out thank you to my cohort <laughs> who helped me with this presentation because they all have different strengths and every person was looking for something different that I right we all work together that way right so I think working with them and explaining it too, like we're not all self contained. The ability one of those 21st century skills is the ability to collaborate and work in a team. Yeah. Yeah. I love those kids. Yeah. I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah. But as Dr. Heffenstein was saying for those on the chat, that to having the empathy instead of feeling threatened by that person. Yes, that's, that's a, thank you.
Mm -hmm. Tying empathy with openness to experience. Yeah. Oh my God, Kate. So tying openness to experience as a predictor. Oh, plus empathy. Yeah, I could see that being a predictor. I'd have to look at Laura Boras' work too and go back to her work because of her dissertation. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Oh, wait, I think Pam had a question too. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. So back to the chat. Okay. Okay. Everybody has strengths. There's not a threat. A level one teacher and a level two or three students. Very, very true. I agree. Amen. Next is uh, compare and contrast your presentation with spiral dynamics, a work that has been compared to the Rousey building that bringing in spiral dynamics would be a big contribution to what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Tell him, okay. yes, okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Sure. So, yes. So, this one or this one? So, this was the model that I had originally created uh, when I went back. Um, all right, so let's talk about this. When I first started to see this, and I, I'm out shopping, trying to figure out, like, how do I actually build this with stuff, right? Because I don't have the computer skills to do this. Um, so what you see here, that, that orange line, it's a piece of metal, it's a metal rod that's going through a slinky. Now it's a perfect orbit right there, because I can't really smash the slinky that easily to make, like, these odd, uh, weird elliptical orbits, okay? But the reddish B is on the mean. So those are the students. If we were to look at like a um, like a scatter plot, all right. When we take a look at this and we do, let's say we do testing at the beginning of the year at the school year, we're like, oh look, everybody's all clustered right here for this particular curriculum. Let's say for math. But you may have somebody who's just slightly above. But on a scatter plot, it looks like they're all within where they should be within the first month or two of the school year, what that teacher has to teach for that curriculum. Okay, if that's our variable. If you were to pull that scatter plot out into three dimensions and actually start putting each student, right, knowing where they are, you would actually find, you may find some of your really highly gifted kids are far beyond just one or two months ahead in that particular part of curriculum. They may be eight, 10 months or a couple of years ahead. But because we're still looking in 2D, this is the problem. We're not actually, we may know, oh, they're just a little ahead. They'll be my helpers, right? So, um, so this is the first part of it. So the sun is the mean. We are moving through space, right? Not just on the planet, but our whole solar system. It's like we're constantly, that's the next image, that gif I had. The blue bead, is somebody who's kind of spiraling around. So if you were to even look, they may be at that second, third standard deviation, more on that outer rim of the students in the class. If you were to then look at IQ. Mm -hmm. Oh, so the Z, oh, the, so the Z, okay, yes. Yeah, so the Z plot. So this is where you have to use the dependent variable. Okay, I chose the appearance of competency. That is what you plug in. So is it going to be curriculum? Is it age? Is it you know social skills? Is it um, social emotional development, right? Is it uh, fine motor skills? It's what you're gonna plug in as your dependent variable. Does that make sense? That's how you're, you, if you were to look at all of this at once, that's like saying, hey, I'm gonna look at this child's a full scale IQ, but they're in college at 10 or 11, but they can't tie their shoes yet. So you can't use like full scale, right? We know this with two E kids, you have to use a GAI. You have to be able to tease these things out and look at them because they're, they've got such discrepancy. Some of their skills may be very high and some they're still working on. What? Yeah, I've done the, the, the AC personality, I think that's what we're getting at, yeah. it's like, 
I don't know which, where, where it is in the slide, but you have like the perfectly circular orbit and then you showed like slightly more elliptical orbits through there. Yeah, yeah. This one? No, it was, um, it has a different color. So you had like the circular there. And that's the one. Yeah, I like how like at a certain point, like it's speeding up and then as it gets towards the outer, yep. as it's slowing down, you can really see like, I don't know, I think this is a good way of showing like asynchronous development, exactly like sometimes it, you know, the kid's way ahead of the curve in one area, really behind in something else, but you could go another year down the line and maybe the skill that they were really ahead on last time. Take off. Now they're right, yeah. Take so, off. And by the way, not only have I lived eight, I live it with my own child too, who's also twice exceptional. And I have watched him literally look like he's stagnating, if not even regressing for months and months at a time. And it gets frustrating for his teachers and I get phone calls. It's frustrating for us, right? And then one day it's like he wakes up and it just clicked. Right. Thank you, Lance. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. We gotta wrap up. That is so cool. What could be the satellites, like the moons of the yeah of these planets? And Pluto, there's a reason why Pluto is no longer considered a planet. Right. Right. But we have to think about that and you have to think about the larger implications within society as well. Wait a minute. You know, is it because they're so asynchronous because they're just not fitting within what we consider? Yes, there's other reasons. Okay, I'm not going to get into that. But in terms of just the metaphor. So thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. What's that? Yeah. All right. So